Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ. We're meeting in Madison, Wisconsin, and we are so glad to have you with us tonight. This is for our Wednesday evening Bible study, and tonight we are coming to the very end of our relatively quick study of the book of Leviticus. We hope to be covering Leviticus chapters 26 and 27 tonight, so we want to invite you as always to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Leviticus chapter 26. We'll be there in just a few moments. If you have any questions, if you have any comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to me at 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are concluding our study of Leviticus. We've been studying in the wilderness, in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and we are coming to the very end of Leviticus tonight. A major theme in the book of Leviticus is holiness, that is being separate or different, set apart from the world. We've learned that Leviticus is basically a handbook or a manual for the priests, the Levites, for those who were responsible for helping the people maintain this holiness before the Lord in the wilderness. We've had a summary of the major types of sacrifices in those opening chapters. We've seen the priest ordained. We've seen the first catastrophe as Nadab and Abihu offer unauthorized fire and they are killed on the spot before the Lord for doing that. We've had a summary of what is clean, what is unclean. We've had some revolutionary guidelines for preventing outbreaks of disease. Uh, we looked at the holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would make a sacrifice for the people. He would also put the sins of the people on the scapegoat and would then send that goat off into the wilderness. We then looked at a rather lengthy series of commands that were intended to make a clear distinction between God's people and the locals up there in the promised land where they're heading. And we move rather quickly through those, not covering every verse, but just giving the highlights of those. Uh, basically, we had a long list of various sexual sins and then a wide variety of other rules and regulations, just making sure that God's people would be different from the world around them in the land where they were moving. And then last week, we looked at some rules that were specific to the priest, and then we did an overview of the major holidays or feast days. And to help that make sense, we looked at these in chart form. So what you see here is the big picture of these major feast days. And this was my way of kind of helping it make sense to me. And again, that came from the NIV Study Bible many years back and uh, kind of did a good job, I think they did, on summarizing that. And then we kind of simplified it for the PowerPoint here. So this is an overview of what the uh, priest would be responsible for leading the people through these feast or uh, fellowship special sacrifice days throughout the year. Well, tonight we are going to finish Leviticus by looking at chapters 26 and 27. So again, be finding a Bible, be turning with me to Leviticus chapters 26 and 27. And let's start tonight with the blessings of obedience. And we find these in Leviticus 26, 1 through 13. And if you're familiar with the Bible, you may know that we have a similar list of blessings toward the end of Deuteronomy. Basically, Deuteronomy, as I understand it, is a repetition of the law, the second uh, rehearsal or speaking of the law, communication of the law, uh, right before they cross over. Uh, but these seem to be aimed specifically at the priests. So since this is in the book of Leviticus, I mean, the priests, after all, they are the ones who will take a leading role in, in keeping the people holy. Again, that's a major theme in this book. So let's take a look tonight, beginning with Leviticus 26, verses 1 through 13, where God says this, You shall not make for yourselves idols, nor shall you set up for yourselves an image or a sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary, I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, then I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering, and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. I shall also grant peace in the land so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land, and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. 
So I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will confirm my covenant with you. You will eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves, and I broke the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. Well, in terms of obedience, let's notice that God's very first concern on this list is that the people not make for themselves any idols. So they are not to worship anyone or anything other than God himself. God comes first. And this is basically the first in the Ten Commandments as well. This is extremely important. This is the first commandment. And the second big concern is that the people honor the Sabbaths. And this reference seems to be not only the seventh day, but notice it, it also seems really here to be the seventh year when the people were to let the land rest. And the result of obedience, the result of letting the land rest, was that God would cause the land to be fruitful. And so there was a direct correlation between honoring the Sabbath year and making the land productive. And this is one of those commands that's obviously very practical. From a soil conservation point of view, God says, you gotta let the land rest, and if you do, if you obey me, uh, some very good things will happen with your harvesting. Uh, beyond the obvious benefits of allowing the land to rest, God also promises peace, so protection from wild animals. He promises political peace, and uh, certainly also promises this close and peaceful relationship uh, with himself, with God. So let's continue tonight by moving along now and looking at a, a lengthy series of curses if the people refuse to obey the Lord. And this starts in Leviticus 26, 14 through 22. And this is just the first of several paragraphs. Leviticus 26, 14 through 22. But if you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes, and if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commandments, and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption, and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies will eat it up. I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. If also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will also break down your pride of power. I will also make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. Your strength will be spent uselessly for your land will not yield its produce and the trees of the land will not yield their fruit. If then you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. I will let loose among you the beast of the field, which will bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your number so that your roads lie deserted. So again, on one hand, if the people obey, God is promising to bless them tremendously. But here on the other hand, if they reject God's commandments, God now promises a series of terrible things that'll happen. And this comes as the result of the people abhorring God's ordinances. Now, we may not often think about hating what God has told us to do, but God is warning about it right here. There are times when God's people may actually be tempted to hate what God has commandment, uh, commanded. Um, in ancient times, if it gets to that point, notices, notice here, uh, God promises to undo all those blessings from the previous paragraph. And so this is the opposite of that first paragraph we just read. So instead of peace, instead of dominating their enemies, God now turns that around. And God promises terror and disease and drought and destruction and death. Well, all of this death and destruction isn't just God being vindictive. This is not just God being mean. But I want us to notice in the next paragraph, this is designed to try to teach a lesson and to bring the people back. That's the purpose of it. And I say that because of what comes next in Leviticus 26, 23 through 33. Leviticus 26, 23 through 33, where God says, And if by these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you. And I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sins. I will also bring upon you a sword which will execute vengeance for the covenant. 
And when you gather together into your cities, I will send pestilence among you, so that you shall be delivered into enemy hands. When I break your staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, and they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts, so that you will eat and not be satisfied. Yet if in spite of this you do not obey me, but act with hostility toward me or against me, then I will act with wrathful hostility against you, and I, even I, will punish you seven times for your sins. Further, you will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you will eat. I then will destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and heap your remains on the remains of your idols, for my soul shall abhor you. I will lay waste your cities as well and will make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not smell your soothing aromas. I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle in it will be appalled over it. You, however, I will scatter among the nations, and I will draw and will draw out a sword after you, as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. So again, God isn't just being mean with all of this. He's not just being hateful for no reason. Uh, but his goal in all of this is to bring the people back. And notice he indicates this twice in this passage. There's an if in verses 23 and 27. So the promised blessings are conditional. And the curses here are designed to remind the people that they play a role in receiving God's continued blessings. And so again, we have the promise of death and destruction and vengeance and famine. And notice the famine will be so bad, according to verse 29, that the people will eat their own children. And we actually see this happen, don't we? By the way, over in 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, when the king of Aram comes down and besieges Samaria, uh, the famine is so bad during that siege, in fact, that two women come to the king with a disagreement. One woman is mad because she made an agreement with her neighbor that they would eat her son one day, they would eat the other woman's son the next day, and now they've eaten her son, but the other woman is backing out on that agreement and refusing to eat her son. You know, what a messed up situation, isn't it? It's hard to imagine that. However, in response to this disagreement between the two women, the king doesn't repent and turn to God. No, he vows to get the head of Elisha the prophet on a platter. And so it had no effect on him. You would think he would have remembered this from the book of Leviticus. But the point is, the famine was promised by the Lord if the people ever rejected their end of that covenant agreement. And that promise was fulfilled a number of times, uh, both in the northern kingdom as well as in the south. Well, this brings us to something else God has in mind for when his people ignore his commands. Let's take a look at Leviticus 26, verses 34 through 39. Leviticus 26, 34 through 39. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation, while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it will observe the rest, which it did not observe on your Sabbaths while you were living in it. As for those of you who may be left, I will also bring weakness into their hearts in the, la in the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a driven leaf will chase them. And even when no one is pursuing, they will flee as though from the sword, and they will fall. They will therefore stumble over each other, as if running from the sword, although no one is pursuing, and you will have no strength to stand up before your enemies. But you will perish among the nations, and your enemy's land will consume you, so those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the lands of your enemies. And also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. And so there is a practical aspect here to God allowing his people to be taken captive as a result of them disobeying the commands. And that is, the land will finally enjoy all of its Sabbaths that have been ignored down through the years. In other words, God is basically saying, since you didn't allow the land to rest as you were instructed, I will force the land to rest. You can't farm it if you're not in it. So I'm going to take you out of the land. And remember, as we discussed several uh, weeks ago, they, they are not to plant any crops the seventh year. And that would have been a huge leap of faith. So not planting would have gone against everything a farmer believes. We need crops to survive. And so here God is asking us not to plant. That is a huge test of faith. And so the punishment then for ignoring that test of faith or failing the test would involve the people being taken away, which would then allow the land to recover after years of this yearly abuse. Well, at the end of this chapter and uh, after the blessings and the curses, it's amazing that now God offers a way back. 
So here at the end of chapter 26, we come to verses 40 through 46, Leviticus 26, 40 through 46, where God says, If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness, which they committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies, or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they then make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember also my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham as well, and I will remember the land. For the land will be abandoned by them and will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, will be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and the ordinances and laws which the Lord established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. So notice God then, even after punishing his own people for their disobedience, he gives them a way to come back. They have to confess their iniquity. They have to confess their unfaithfulness. And I find it interesting that they are confessing not only their own iniquity, but they also have to confess the iniquity of their forefathers. Isn't that interesting? That could be hard to do, to confess that my ancestors were wrong. You know, a lot of times today we have these discussions and people say, well, you know, I didn't do whatever it is we're talking about. And there is a sense in which, yes, that's true, but there's also a sense in which we perhaps have benefited from what others have done that's wrong. And in that sense, there may be a value to confessing. And I just want to point that out here. Uh, these people were called upon not only to confess their own sins, but also the sins of their forefathers to say, we, yes, as a nation, uh, we did something that was offensive to God, and, and that is extremely difficult to do. To confess is to say the same thing as. And so in this context, when God tells the people that they've done wrong, confessing would be saying, yes, we have. And of course, even today when we confess, we are agreeing with God's assessment that yes, we have in fact sinned. And notice this is tied to humility in verse 41. It takes humility to confess sin to admit that we've been wrong about something. God is God. We are not. He knows what's best for us. And here, if his people humble themselves and confess their sins, God promises to remember his covenant. Not that he ever forgot it. He didn't. But he's promising here to go back to the blessing side of the covenant if his people confess that what they've been doing is wrong. Well, starting in the middle of this passage, we come to a description of God's people making amends for their iniquity. Um, so their punishment is uh, perhaps that we might say a, a part of accepting responsibility. It's accepting the consequence. We can't say, oh, sorry for what I did, but now I can't get in trouble for it because I've apologized. That's not the way that works. And so even in their punishment, though, God will not destroy them completely, but he allows them this way to return, a way back. And in their punishment, God is not breaking the covenant, but he is fulfilling the covenant. So they can't say, well, things are going bad for us. God must not love us. No, that was in, a, in the original agreement that if you obey, you'll be blessed. If you disobey, you'll be punished. And uh, I mean, right here in this chapter, the covenant involves both blessings and curses. So just because you suffer consequences uh, doesn't mean that God has dropped his end of the agreement. Now, the punishment is proof of God fulfilling his end of the agreement, and it's proof that we've dropped our end of it. Um, at the end of this chapter, Moses summarizes these are the statutes and the ordinances and the laws which the Lord established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. So that brings us now to the last chapter. Let's look at the last chapter of, Levit of Leviticus, where we come to what I am almost describe as an appendix. So that last verse we just read at the end of chapter 26, that would have been a really good way to end the book. But it's almost like, oh, and one more thing. So we're going to have one more chapter tacked on here at the end, some bonus information. Um, concerning how to put a value on various vows that people may make. So let's start with Leviticus 27, 1 and 2. Leviticus 27, 1 and 2. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man makes a difficult vow, 
he shall be valued according to your valuation of persons belonging to the Lord. Well, this is in Leviticus because it's directed to the priest, and it's included here because this is an issue that the priests are going to have to deal with on a regular basis. In verse 2, God acknowledges that sometimes people will make a difficult vow. Now, when you think of somebody in the Bible making a difficult vow, what comes to mind? What do we think about? If we talk about somebody making a, a difficult or a rash vow, in my mind, and I think most of you are also thinking probably of Jephthah in the Judges. Remember Jephthah? He pretty much promised the Lord, and I'm paraphrasing here, but in Judges chapter 11, God, if I win this battle, I promise to sacrifice as a burnt offering the first thing that comes out to greet me when I get home. Well, uh, Jephthah dominates in that battle, but of course when he gets home, his daughter runs out to meet him. That right there is a difficult vow. And I believe the Bible explains that he fulfills that vow, but we aren't really told exactly how he does that. And the challenge is, if Jephthah really offered his daughter as a burnt offering to the Lord, then we've got a leader in Israel offering up a child sacrifice to God. And that is something God clearly condemns among the local Canaanites. That's why the Canaanites are getting driven out, because they would do stupid stuff like that. And so if, if Jephthah actually burns his daughter alive as a sacrifice to God, I mean, that's like, that's kind of a problem, isn't it? Well, the way I see it, Leviticus chapter 27, though, gives us at least another possibility. And again, there's a lot we don't know, a lot that we're not told about Jephthah and what happened next. But throughout the rest of Leviticus 27, we have the idea of putting a value on something that has been vowed, and then offering to God the value instead of the actual person, place, or thing. So that's just my quick summary of the whole chapter. And we're not going to read through all of this. If you've got this open in your lap, feel free. Um, but in verses 3 through 8, we've got valuations on various ages of men, women, and children. So if, you know, if it's an old man, he's worth less than a, a working age man, and so on. Um, in verses 9 through 13, we have valuations on animals of various kinds. In verses 14 through 15, we've got valuations on a person's house. Uh, like if you pledge your house to God, how do you deal with that? Um, in verses 16 through 25, we have instructions on how to put a value on a field or a piece of property. In verses 26 and 27, we have instructions on how to value the firstborn since they were dedicated to the Lord. Uh, God gives instructions on how, to, how basically to buy them back from God, to redeem them. And a lot of this, I think it's adding a fifth. Um, and so you would take the value plus a fifth on some of this stuff here. But feel free to read that on your own. It's just interesting. Um, if, if anything was set aside to be destroyed, like actually destroyed, um, that could not be redeemed. Uh, but in verses 30 and 33, we've got instructions concerning how to redeem something that is part of the tithe, the 10%. So that's kind of a summary of Leviticus chapter 27. Then we close with verse 34, <laughs> where he almost repeats from the last chapter and says, Oh, by the way, goodbye again. But uh, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. And that is the end of the book of Leviticus. So we have studied all 27 chapters of Leviticus, I believe, in seven lessons. And I didn't go back and count these, but about seven lessons, which means that we've covered just under four chapters a week. I'm no math genius, but uh, we have been booking it through this book. Uh, we have made good, I think, on our promise of moving rather quickly. I didn't want us to get bogged down in the details. Not that the details are unimportant. There is a value to Leviticus, but I don't want to be studying Leviticus for an entire year. And I think some of you might agree with me on that. There is other stuff in the Bible we need to look at. And uh, so we've been doing something of an overview. We have looked in the Wednesday night class, by the way, at every single verse in the Bible. It took us 22 years, and uh, some of you were here for, for that. And we're not going to do that again. I don't know if I'll live long enough to do that. And so we're kind of doing an overview here. So next week, if the Lord wills, we're going to move along into the book of Numbers. So we've looked at Genesis, Exodus. Now we've looked at Leviticus. We are heading now for the book of Numbers. If you want to read ahead, read ahead the first four or five chapters. And, and again, we plan on moving rather quickly through numbers as well. As always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. If there's something that we need to be praying about, let us know. If there's something that we can do to encourage you or help you, reach out. 
You can send an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we have learned tonight that you are a God who loves your people. You want what's best for us, and like the ancient Israelites, we have been promised blessings when we obey and consequences when we do not. And so, Father, we pray tonight asking for wisdom to listen, and we ask for the strength to put what we learn from your word into practice. When tempted, we ask for your help in finding the way of escape that you've promised. And, Father, we ask for the courage to take it. Thank you, Father, for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. Thank you for loving us. We love you, and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.